make of the story of Esau and Jacob. Last week, we heard the story of how their parents were betrothed. Theirs was a story with a happy ending, a story of goodwill and peace and harmony, of answered prayer and a blessing. Then we come to this story. The same people, Isaac and Rebecca, are central to the story. But rather than living out their days in the happily ever after, their lives are marred by barrenness and conflict. It seems living within God's plan and purpose does not automatically mean that life goes along smoothly. Sometimes it's exactly the opposite. Most of the time, actually. The fact is that Isaac and Rebecca's family proved to be as dysfunctional as many of our own. God's covenant is kept, but it's not kept easily or neatly or peacefully. Now, this story starts with a reality check. Like Isaac's parents before them, Isaac and Rebecca haven't had any children after years of marriage. And again, the promise of the covenant looks like it will alter. After going so far to find just the right wife for Isaac, how could this happen? Their problem was beyond what we planning, wealth, or even deeply held love to fix. But in an act of faith, I had prayed. And he gave his problem over to God. And his prayer was answered with the gift of not just one, but two sons. But such a gift. Not a gift that brought peace and harmony, but a gift that brought conflict which would eventually hit husband and his wife. Now, Rebecca recognized right away that something was wrong. Even while she carried them, the twins were wrestling against one another, vying for supremacy. Why well, I think Rebecca took this to God. But rather than being reassured, the answer she was given foreshadowed the lifelong wrestling match Brothers. Two people, two nations struggle within you, she was told. One people will be stronger than the other, the elder will serve the younger. This gift was about to turn the social order upside down. This gift would become two distinct peoples who would wrestle against one another. Why such a gift? We don't know. But we do know that in all families, rivalry is probably more than warm than peaceful harmony. All the experts of family life will have us believe that disharmony is a result of poor, plan poor planning and parenting. We are told that all families should be loving and supportive like the Waltons on the old TV show. In our desperate search for cause and effect, lots of blame gets passed around. But the ancient stories that we find in Genesis are much more realistic about our lives. From the death of Abel to his brother selling Joseph as a slave, there is a recognition that family conflict and family rivalry are part and parcel of family life. And then the babies are born and named. The first baby was red and covered all over with hair like a garment. He was named Esau. That means red. The nation that descended from Esau was Edom, which also means red in the ancient Hebrew language. They lived in Seir, in the foothills of the desert of Arabia. The Hebrew word for Seir means hairy. So his appearance at birth and his name foreshadowed the nation that would come from him. In many ways, Esau was a very likable chap. We are told that he grew up to be a man of the outdoors who loved to hunt. He was his father's favorite. And he appeared to be a trusting and open and actually a very forgiving man. The second baby was born holding the heel of the first. This baby, called Jacob, the word means heel. It's a play on the Hebrew word. And it can also mean to plant it. And one who kicks his way out. That very much was Jacob all of his life. In Jacob, we see a cunning intelligence at work. 
there is trickery and deception in his nature. Now, as the youngest, he had the privilege of power in a world where social order was maintained by giving all rights and a double portion of the father's wealth to the oldest. The youngest really had little going for him. Youngest sons were in the same category as widows, orphans, and foreigners. They were in a position of social weakness. But Jacob's destiny was to struggle against the powerless position placed upon him at his birth. Esau was the strongest, both physically and socially. But Jacob, the trickster, turned the social order upside down. Now, as they grew older, their nature started to dictate how their destinies were to unfold, as the story of the birthright reveals. Esau had been out working in the fields, presumably caring for his father's extensive flocks and herds. And he came in famished. He wanted an immediate fix, something right now that would satisfy his hunger. <coughs> and Jacob had something he wanted food. But rather than carrying it up for his brother to feed him, Jacob bargained. And it's a tough bargain at that. Jacob would not give his brother any food. Esau swore a solemn oath to give Jacob his birthright. That is, all the privileges and power that automatically are given to the eldest of birth. So why does it appear that God favors this skinny, hard-hearted young man? Esau, we are told, despised his birthright. as a man who managed to control his own life. He relied on himself to make his own way. He was a man of initiative and action, and these are all qualities that we admire. In fact, you may recognize yourself or someone you know as an Esau type. Yet, perhaps, it is this very quality of self-reliance that prevented Esau from becoming dependent on God, or even acknowledging that God played very much any part in his life. And maybe that gives us a clue about our relationship to God. Maybe, just maybe, against all fairness that we can see, it is the person who recognizes their own weakness and inability to cope who is in the best position to recognize the hand of God working to guide and protect and help them. A number of years ago, I watched an interview with Jude Caldwell. June was a woman that I admired very much for many reasons. She was bright, she was articulate, and she fought for what she believed was right, for what she believed in. <clears throat> now, she had a difficult childhood. Her father left the family when she was 14 years of age, and her mother was left to raise two daughters on her own, and they didn't have very much money. Money that had been set aside for June's education was used to pay the bills, so June never attended university, at least not when she was a young person. But June was very self-reliant and determined, and she successfully made her own way. She became a social activist. She started Casey's House, that is a hospice for people with AIDS. She started Nellie's, a home for uh, shelter for women. She raised four children. She worked as a freelance writer, and she had a loving and successful when she was asked if she believed in God, she said no. She understood God to be quality and human kindness. Ultimately, June, who was an independent self-starter, believed in the goodness of the human spirit. And that was what she saw as the Almighty. What struck me in this interview, and probably why it's taken me, is that June is Esau. As a strong and self-reliant individual, she maybe could not fathom relying on anything or anyone but herself. And a very strength blinded her to the power of God all around her, like he saw. Of the two sons of Isaac and Rebecca, Esau was probably the most likable, the most easy to respect, the one that we could trust. While Jacob, the schemer, was downright sneaky at times, not someone that would be judged to serve God's favor. And here the scandal of God smacks us in the face, for God uses and cares for and protects the most undeserving, maybe even the most unlikable people. It was Jacob who was destined to fulfill the promise of the covenant, not Esau. 
Now, being the carrier of God's covenant didn't make his life easy or harmonious, exactly the opposite of that. His life was one of struggle and sorrow. It was marked with conflict. Conflict with his brother Esau. Conflict with his uncle Laban. Conflict between his wives, Leah and Rachel. And conflict between his sons. It was marked with sorrow. Sorrow over the early death of Rachel. Sorrow over the loss of his son Joseph. But out of this conflict and this sorrow, the covenant nation was created, born in slavery and born in the wandering through a desert wasteland. Jacob kicked against all social norms. He supplanted his brother, he tricked his father, and he wrestled with God. He came to faith by breaking all the rules and bearing the sorrow which was brought him. But he also lived his life dependent upon God because he learned early that by right, he was entitled to nothing. He came to understand that all he had, he received as a gift from God. Grace means gift. And it scandalizes us because it turns our well-ordered sense of fairness and social order upside down. As Philip Yancey wrote in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Grace is undeserved, unmerited, and unfair. Like the parable of the landlord who paid the, who paid the higher power the same wages no matter what point of the day he was starting to work. And yet he went on to write that grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. He loves us. That is the nature of God. Jacob was a scandal from the beginning. He kicked against life and turned the social order upside down. And we might not think of this, but Jesus was also a scandal to the people amongst whom he lived. He was called a drunkard and a glutton, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And he also turned the social order upside down by welcoming in all those deemed an affront to God's holiness. All those who were blind, had leprosy, were maimed, were lame, who could not enter into the covenant community because of some physical infirmity. He welcomed in women who were basically outside the true covenant community. If you can remember the temple, it was Gentiles and women, and that's as far as they could go, of course, the holy of holies. Jesus welcomed in everyone. Graciously, he ate and drank with the likes of Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus embodied the scandal of God's grace and so showed us the radical love of God. God loves us not because we have done anything to him, but not because we are good, not because we are nice, not because we are likable. Because that is the nature of God. All we have to do is to accept his love. And we do that by turning our lives over to him. That his purpose may be fulfilled in us. And when we do this, we will find that his power carries us. For as Jesus said, of all those who came to him, his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and we will find rest for